Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 2nd, 2017, and this is the week in charts. I want to thank you guys for taking time out of your busy schedule and girls to be here. I appreciate that. I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we going to talk about? Well, let's talk about this uh, current bull market that we're in. And I guess the question is, is it a current bull market? It's taken a little bit of a pause, but some sectors are waking up. while other ones are lagging a bit, and that's, that's normal. And we'll take a look at all that in a few minutes. Uh, your questions are on trading and your favorite stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks. If you do the show, hold off on your stock picks uh, until we get to the actual charts. And then once we get there, just ask about one stock at a time. Um, last week, I think I got a little tripped up, and I was talking to one of you guys, and give, you gave me a little constructive criticism. And I agree. I was a little uh, mixed up with the um, cognizant or flippant, flippant discussion. So we'll we'll get to that, and I'll reiterate a few things on that, touch base on that, and then we'll move on to some actual charts and a chart show, believe it or not. I want to come back to improving performance with discretion, and there's some things with money management, two things. One, avoiding catastrophes, as you'll soon see, soon see, and then also using discretion to improve performance. And the combination of those two things can go a long ways towards your success. I guess before we do that, we have to look at the disclaimer screen. As you know, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, we're not going to spend too much time on this because we talked about a lot about it last week. But essentially, Curtis Faith was one of the original turtles, and he made a lot of money, and he was one of the more successful turtles way back in the day. And his book, The Way of the Turtle, as I've said before, is a worthy read. Uh, again, I don't recommend you rush out and trade a breakout type of system like they traded. But uh, the, the reason is because the drawdowns are invisible. But his trading psychology that he talks about quite a bit is kind of interesting. And um, I should have his book in today. He's got a book on psychology. So I'll read that and see how it turns out. But Mr. Faith blew up. And in the interview on YouTube, they asked him, like, well, how could you – make all this money and then lose all this money. And he's like, well, the point is that in order to make the money, you had to be capable of losing the money. So he was trading a system that had abysmal drawdowns, but he didn't care. And sometimes you have abysmal drawdown and then you, you come flying out of it. Sometimes you print money and you can't take those profits. You just have to let them ride. And so he just had this flippant attitude. So, the fact that he didn't care, that allowed him to make the money in the first place. So had he not had that attitude, he never would have made the money to begin with. But the same attitude was also led to his demise. Now, my point is, if you're following a viable system, you have to have the attitude of not caring both good and bad. You can't let it go to your head when things are going well, and you can't let it just make you distraught when things aren't going so well. So we were talking about being cognizant a couple of weeks ago, and last week we talked about being flippant, and I kind of confused the two and mixed them up a little bit. But cognizant is basically being aware, and flippant means that you don't care. Now, when it comes to following a, a system, now we're talking about a viable system where you have something that, that you have seen works longer term, both uh, empirically and actually, not just some sort of back-testing but uh, I guess what the system people would call walk forward testing, real testing in real markets. And if you're cognizant of, of your following the system, what I'm saying is you want to make sure you're not making any emotionally charged decisions, that you're actually following the system. And you want to make sure you're not going through any unnecessary emotional round trips. So one question to ask yourself is, are you as close to the market as you need to be but no closer? Because a couple of weeks ago when I talked about being cognizant, I... I think I went a little bit overboard and watched the markets too much to see what my emotions would be so I could come back and report to you later about what's going on. So you have to be careful in the process as to not get too close to the markets. 
In other words, if you're trading a longer term trend following system, and let's say you're already taking profits and you've got a, a fairly loose trailing stop in place, there's nothing to do. Watching that every tick does not help the market move in the right direction, in the intended direction. If it did, I'd be the richest man on earth, okay? But I've gotten a lot better over, prior, over uh, recent years. So be cognizant, especially of your feelings, and make sure you're actually following the system. Now, being flippant is fully following and continue to follow the system regardless of the outcome. And it sucks sometimes when you get these drawdowns, and it sucks to get stopped out. And by the way, if you're on my trading service and a stock gets hit 10% like one did yesterday, you don't have to email me and tell me it got hit 10%. I know, okay? <laughs> so it happens, and it comes with the territory. But you have to kind of, I hate to say this, but you have to kind of like not give a shit about it. And I know it's easier said than done. We're all emotional beings and we do have emotions and we can't trade without those emotions and we have to embrace those, those emotions. But you have to be willing to continue to follow along as long as your system is a viable system. And as one of my clients once said, you have to sing like you don't need the money. And I've actually written about this quite a bit on the website, in the blog or the columns, whatever you want to call those things. I hate that word blog for some reason. So last week I touched upon the fact that you want to keep an emotional journal. Obviously you want a trading journal, and uh, there's some really good ways of doing that. Uh, Microsoft OneNote, uh, as somebody pointed out years ago, is really good if you just want to like cut and paste things in and write things in as far as your trades and all. Uh, I like to use uh, Evernote for a lot of other things. I don't really use it that much for a trading journal because I just keep things in a spreadsheet. But if you're struggling, I would encourage you to do that. And then I would also encourage you to keep an emotional journal. For this, I would keep it in an actual notebook and just write down your feelings. And um, a few years back, I was cleaning out the office, and I decided to just get rid of all these notebooks that I had with tons and tons of information. And then I found that early in my career, when I struggled quite a lot, I would write down my emotions. And I think that that really helped me to wrap my head around the markets and that markets go up and markets go down. And more importantly, they don't always move in my favor. So that's one thing we touched upon last week. So hopefully we have that, uh, hopefully that clarifies things a little bit. And as I often preach, busy traders make good traders. A few weeks ago when I was doing this cognizant thing and being cognizant of my emotions and, and that was my focus, I found myself, like I said, watching the screen a little bit too much and then when I found myself getting frustrated with some business aspects that weren't going my way, um, and I got kind of stuck in some in some some technical issues, I found myself watching the market more and more, which happened to dovetail in with me being cognizant, which the cycle began for me to get aggravated and drop more and more F-bombs and things like that. The next week, I, I was no longer worried as much about getting my fodder for my week in charts, and... I fixed those issues or got a little help on those issues, I should, I should say. So I was able to move on and stay crazy busy once again. And then I only took trades that I had to. Not that I took any trades prior to that before, but I might have been a little more encouraged to. And I certainly didn't take any unnecessary action or feel the emotions that I had to take the unnecessary action because I simply was too busy. And I know I've told the story a thousand times uh, in more recent times, but a client of mine who, who does really well and then struggles a bit because he overtrades and makes a lot of mistakes and then does really well and then struggles a bit. It's kind of like rinse and repeat. He recently told me that his trading got a lot better. And he didn't have some big epiphany or decided that that's it. From now on, I'm following the system. What happened was one of his doctors quit, and now he's working days and nights. So he has to work his practice that he has to go pick up a shift at the hospital until he can find a replacement. And in the meantime, he simply does not have time to take trades that are less than ideal. So, again, busy traders make good traders. So, any questions on, on those two concepts of, of being cognizant of what's going on and being flippant? You have to be flippant in how you follow things. Again, I don't want to beat the dead horse too much. And the way you, you reach that level where you just sort of don't care is that you're making sure you plan those trades ahead of time. Plan, as I often say, while things are static, as Montier has pointed out, when information is changing or uncertain, 
your stress level goes up. So you need to plan while things are static, and then in the heat of battle, you don't want to be trying to make a plan, and you just want to follow along, and you want to be flippant at that point, okay? Went to Vegas, cognizant to split eights, but flip it, don't care. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good point. You know, we always hate to make these uh, these gambling analogies, but I think you're supposed to split eights, right? So it's like that. Almost, you almost have to, to do that mechanically if you're playing blackjack. You have to, there's, a general, there's general rules that you have to follow. I don't play blackjack because I like to have a couple drinks when I gamble, and I don't want to have to think. I, I have to think too much in my daily life. So I don't really play blackjack. So craps is something that's just kind of willy-nilly and a little bit more fun. And blackjack, if you do the wrong thing, the guy next to you, you end up with his card, then he's going to be really pissed off at you. And I, I just don't want to put myself in that situation. Uh, but, yeah, it has to be – you almost have to do things in a mechanical way, especially if you're playing something like blackjack. A lot of uh, – well, one in particular, I have a, I'm good friends with someone who's mechanical trader and actually a couple friends, but uh, they're they're both – they're both more mechanical. They're, I'm sorry. They're both more discretionary traders than they let on to be, because they're not they're not following that system mechanically, mechanically, mechanically. And they say that I'm more mechanical than I than I let on to be, because I'm following a discretionary system mechanically. What that means is I'm actually following a set of rules and I'm adhering to the rules. Okay. So. But there are certain things you do somewhat automatically. And I know it sounds kind of strange, and I'm doing some reading, and it's funny. I'm actually finding some things that sort of confirm what I'm saying. You actually, at least for me, sometimes I have a bit of an out-of-body experience. Uh, and it's not, not that crazy, but it's like I will do things automatically it, it, it doing so, it, it did, I'll realize like after the fact what I did, like it, it's, it's like once you think it's too late, if you're following the system, sometimes you just have to make the move, do the deal. Like when that initial profit target is hit, you don't want to think too much. You just want to take the profits. Now, if the market is going straight through your initial profit target, and it's, it's going like crazy. It's okay to trail a stop or take some other kind of action like that. But if it's just kind of banging, it just kind of hits that top target, you don't want to sit around and think too much. You just want to automatically do it. And sometimes I actually automatically make a trade, and I'll go like, wait a minute, what did I just do? So you have to reach a point where you get the reps in to where it becomes somewhat automatic, just like Howard pointing out that you just split eights. You don't even think about it. You don't think about the fact, well, I lost on two hands. You know what? It happens. All right, let's just let's jump into some charts. Last week I showed you a short, and I showed you why it was a short and not a trend knockout. And the reason was it was making six-week lows, and it pulled back very deeply. Also had a gap in the setup. And then the sector was going higher. And then when you look at the overall market, if you look at the NASDAQ, this was a technology company, and I'll show you the company in just one second. And the NASDAQ was also headed higher. Now, that company was AMD. And there's a couple things to gleam here. First of all, as I said last week, you don't want to fight the tape. Now, I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but every now and then you might think, okay, well, I've got a big portfolio full of tons and tons of longs, and I really like the short setup. And I know that the overall market is headed higher. I know that the sector is, he sector is headed higher. But here's the deal. If this stock begins to implode, if this stock can't go higher in spite of the sector and the market going higher, when it begins to implode, I might have the mother of all setups. So if you feel like you want to take it, that's fine, okay? But if you do take the trade, and the reason I'm talking about this one is this was in my Landry list a few weeks ago as a short setup, and last week as a short setup too, and one of the clients was uh, – talking to me about it. So if you do decide to take a trade like this, you don't want to take a textbook entry, meaning that you don't want to enter right below that low. And that goes for any trade, not just a short side trade against a long market or a short side trade in a bull market. But you don't want to put it right below that low because a little bit of noise will trigger you in 
to the tray. You want to give it a little bit of wiggle room, okay, as usual. You always want to give trades a little wiggle room on these entries. And even if you did decide to, quote, unquote, take the trade, by giving it a little bit of wiggle room, you could see that this stock actually turned around and went straight back up and no capital was put into harm's way. Now, let's hop into some discretionary things. Last week, we talked about how trading was in a game of exacts. And then we had a stop at 205 in HOV, and the stock went down to 204. And then, as you can see, it began to take off from there. The point here is you know that you're getting ready to get stopped out coming into the day, okay? And a lot of times I'll point out to my peeps, hey, guys, if you want to exercise a little discretion in this, we're getting pretty close. It's probably going to stop out. You can give it a little bit of wiggle room. Don't throw caution to the wind, as we'll see in one second. But as you can see, given a little tiny bit of room, in this case it was only one cent, okay? The stock, one cent, the stock began to turn around. Now, somebody pointed out uh, last week, and I need to uh, answer to the email. It got buried in my spam, but you show snapshots of the records, but not the entire record. Well, every day in the trading service, I show the open portfolio. And if anybody wants to go through all of the archives, they're out there, okay? But I'm not showing actual performance of the entire portfolio over the last 10, 15 years. And the reason is because discretion makes all the difference in the world. And I strongly believe in discretion. But in my records, whenever there is a discretionary thing, and if I'm tracking it mechanically, I'll point out that there was some discretion here. So you could see that discretion on the second loaf of this particular stock you'd have a pretty sizable gain as opposed to a loss. Discretion on the HOV, like we just talked about, now it's not a very exciting example, but you can see rather than having a stop out at this loss, you would have a much better profit profile, or I, or I should say the loss isn't quite as bad. So let's take a look at what that means in something like Vail. You can see Vail kind of just nicked that stop right there and then turn around and went straight back up. So you can see that that does make a big difference in the returns by applying a little bit of discretion. So my point here is that in a case like Vail, I think it went like 16 cents below the stop. Okay, so that's not too much, a quarter a point, half a point on a stock that's trading at about $8 a share. That's a fairly volatile stock. That's okay and a little bit of rum, maybe $0.05 cents or $0.10 cents on a stock like HOV, lower price, fairly volatile stock, you could give them a little bit of rum. Now, if you don't have discipline, then by all means, put the stop in, allow yourself to be stopped out. Longer term, you should do fine. You just won't do as well as if you were, as if, as, using, as you would using discretion is what I'm trying to say, okay? So exercising discretion is using your mind to make minor tweaks in attempt to improve performance. And keep, it mi keep in mind that 90% of that discretion is, is fairly early in the trade. Once you get into longer term trend following mode, there really isn't a whole lot to do. I guess like in a case of Veil, maybe sometimes it's, it comes close to a stop and you can give it a tiny bit of wiggle room. But it's early to trade where you need a lot more discretion because you might be getting close to that initial profit target like we talked about over the last few weeks. The NTB, it almost got there, then it almost got there, then it almost got there, then it finally got there, okay, to that initial profit target. They won't always give you a second, a third, a fourth chance like that one did. So sometimes you have to be willing to take that initial profit target a tiny bit early, okay? So we're just making these little tiny tweaks, and most of that's fairly early in the trading process. Once we get into longer-term trend-following mode, there's less and less discretion that's necessary. So these are minor tweaks. We're not ditching the system, and we're not throwing caution to the wind, okay? Now, speaking of throwing caution to the wind, let's take a look at an example of what happens if you do throw caution to the wind and why money management is necessary. This is NOVN. This is one we were long. And this was a stop. Now you could see, you could argue, okay, Dave, well, what if, what about using a little wiggle room in this one? Well, a little wiggle room, yeah.
But throwing caution and wind, you can see this stock continue to plod over the la over the next week after it stopped out. And this is what it looks like. So a little bit less than 100% of that first profit target. Okay. And then, and that's probably because it was a if fast move if memory serves. But we're looking for roughly 1%. This is not where we get rich, okay, or make a lot of money. This just sort of keeps us in the game. And then hopefully on the second loaf, we make a substantial amount of money. In this case, not a whole lot. It went down to 22 it stopped out. Well, that's better than a poke in the eye. Okay, that's 1.3% round numbers on the trade. And then you can see the stock went on to implode. So even if you did give a little wiggle rum and some of this evaporated on you in the discretion, and then you eventually got stopped out at a somewhat smaller profit, that's a lot better than a 7.1% loss, let's say if you didn't use any stops whatsoever. So now you've got over a $7,000 loss, and this is on a 100K portfolio, okay? So what's important here is your percent to recover is now 10.76 on your whole portfolio. Now, if you're in a choppy market, if, let's say the market's been choppy for a year, if you made 10.76% of your entire portfolio, that's actually a pretty good year, okay? So that's a lot of money to make back, and that's why you have to obviously use a stop. So what's great about this is, now you know why we trade. We trade because we'd like to make money. So you get into something like this, and we got in somewhere back here, and you ride it up, and you get a little partial profits out, and you get stopped out, in this case, for a profit, okay? That's awesome. You move on. You can't get attached to it. Um, I'm certainly not a real estate mogul. Uh, my, my parents had a brief foray into, into real estate, and, and they, I think they fell in love with their property. They didn't, they, didn't, uh, they didn't buy, let's say, contract spec things. They bought really nice things, and they, the properties were really nice, and then, but they couldn't make any money in doing that, and the people didn't treat it very nicely. So you can't fall in love with these business relationships. You can't fall in love with your stocks. You can't fall in love with your real estate. Okay. It's just a means to an end. You can't fall in love and say, oh, well, this is a great company. They're doing great things and they're going to go get some drugs out and blah, blah, blah. You just have to see it as a trade and willing to move on and say, you know what? Hey, Novin, so long it thinks for all the fish. So this is why we trade. We trade to make money. We trade. Trade being the key word in that sentence. So, my favorite thing to do is say so long and thanks for all the fish, okay? Bye, Felicia. So let's take a look at one that stopped out last week. We had a buy way back in February on CNX, and then we took partial profits, and then we trailed the stop higher, and then it stopped out, okay? Now, in hindsight, you could always say, well, why didn't you get out early? It's like, well, you don't know, okay? You're a trend follower. And many times we've been in markets and they've consolidated and they take off and they consolidate and then they take off, rinse and repeat. And it sure looked like it was going to do that right here. Unfortunately, it did not. Okay? It happens. But you can't get, you can't look at this as I often preach and be depressed because you lost some money in the end. As I often preach, all trades will eventually end badly, even good ones. But you know what? From here to here, that's a pretty good ride. And if you did that on every trade, you would own the world pretty quickly. Put it this way, if I did it on every trade, you'd never see my fat ass again, okay? Okay. Question is, yeah, AMD didn't play out. Next train, CNX short. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's Craig, yeah. Yeah, Craig was actually the person who was talking to me about... Um, AMD is a short. Uh, I wouldn't rush out and short CNX, and I'll tell you why. It's not coming off. It's not, okay, you could certainly do far worse on the short side, but I would prefer a stock to come off of all-time highs, especially in a case like now where the overall market is doing really, really well. So if I'm going to short anything at this juncture, 
you know, as I often say, match the pattern to the market. So the market is it's at new highs. You would want to be shorting stocks that are coming off of new highs beginning to fail, like the AMD look like it might, okay, as opposed to shorting those stocks that are kind of mid-levels. Now, you're not seeing it in this chart. We could pull it up and get the real charts. But this stock is actually only at mid-levels, and, and that's the reason we liked it so much way back here was because we thought it had the potential to go back to $40 a share. Well, it only went to 20 Well, better than poke in the eye. That's what I say. All right, a couple of announcements, and then we'll hop into the charts, and then we did have a last-minute uh, request, and so I'll, I'll roll that out, uh, or I'll talk about that in just one second. I'm still rolling out the, uh, speaking of rolling out, I'm rolling out the learning management system, and uh, it's, it's, I'm going to use it for both courses, and it's really cool, and I'm pretty excited about it. I really am. I just, um, I need to invent some more time so I can get all this stuff rolled out. But I'm pretty excited about the, the course stuff is going to be really good because so many times uh, I get emails from people, and I know they have my courses, and I know they have, the, they're on my trading service, and I know I preach all these things, and I know they come to the week of charts, but they're still asking some of the same questions. So this way, with a learning management system, I'll know what they have actually watched. And I know a lot of times people won't get around to watching stuff, and then they'll ask questions about it. So even though some of the stuff might seem simple, uh, sometimes watching it again or paying attention when you watch it, or at least if I know you actually watched it, then we can maybe, uh, that goes a long ways towards uh, helping you fully understand things. So anyway, it'll make a lot more, I guess it doesn't make a whole lot of sense so you can actually see it. There may be a nominal charge in some of this, uh, for things outside of the courses, but uh, it, it won't be too bad. And it's going to be worth it as far as being able to find the information. Still working on the beginner's course. I did the first, uh, the first video is done. First video of one segment. Now I've got another 15 segments to do. So, But uh, it's coming out really good. And, and part of the learning management system is actually a quiz that follows. So I can see whether or not you pass your quiz and if, you, if you, your material is actually sinking in. Uh, as far as the trading service is concerned, all the examples I use, or I should say 99.9%, .9%, every now and then there's an example outside the trading service, but 99% of all examples I use come directly from a trading service. I think 100% of everything today came directly from it. So two things, uh, I'd love to have you on the trading service. You can get started at an introductory rate, and that's obvious. And the other thing is follow along on delayed version. Now, if you can't afford to, if you can't afford the service, then just let me know, and I'll keep you on delayed for as long as possible. There's a limit to how many people I can keep on the system, and uh, if you can't afford the sir, and you can C A N afford the service, and you've been on delayed for over a year, I'll probably kick you off. Uh, I'm not being mean; it's just busy traders. I'm sorry, busy traders make good traders. Yeah, busy traders make good traders, as I said earlier. But uh, good traders make quick decisions, and if you can't decide after a year, maybe you should find something else to do. I know it's kind of bassy, but there's some truth to that. Now, I got an email right before I got started. It says, can you say bow tie, silver, and gold in the same sentence soon? Um, possibly. Let's take a look at that. That's another one of those uh, mid-level type of things. So let me pop out the charts here. Keep the question coming. That's good. <laughs> we all have fat asses. Pressing a button doesn't burn too many calories. Yeah, boy, I tell you, I've got a, I've got an injury here that I'm dealing with, uh, and and I'm, for once in my life, I'm actually bummed out that I can't exercise. I'm have well, I certainly have to find something else to do, I guess, to keep me moving. But yeah. It made me realize how little we move after um, a week of not exercising. Anyway, the question is about gold. If you guys want to uh, eat less. Oh, man, are you kidding me? What? Oh. No. <laughs> no. Who wants to do that? Um, question is about gold and silver. And if you guys want to start asking about uh, individual stocks, uh, feel free to do so now. Just, again, uh, one per line and then hit return. So gold is sort of bow tied in here, um, but if you back the chart out a little bit, it's not coming off of these all-time lows. 
But it's it's not horrible. It's not bad. I'd prefer if it was coming off of all-time lows. In an ideal world, I'd actually like to see it come down here, test its 2016 lows, and then make that ultimate bottom. But it's okay because it's fairly close to that these 2016 lows. I just would be a lot more excited about it if it if it were. And I guess just in looking at it, and this is a great thing about teaching, it forces you to look at things uh, and kind of pick them apart. I guess it is a little bit of a head and shoulders uh, type of bottom, like a weekly chart. So it looks okay. I'm just not super duper excited about rushing out to the gold stocks just yet. Now silver, same sort of action. Now silver is a little bit at a little bit higher levels than gold. So again, I just per, would prefer if it was way down here testing the 2016 lows and coming off of them. Uh, but it looks okay. And, and I hear where he's coming from by saying a little bit of a bow tie. So they are beginning to turn back up. Um, if a market comes down and the only problem, especially like with silver, is that when a market comes down and bottoms out, when a market comes down and kind of bottoms out and then makes a bow tie, okay, like back here, right here or something, you don't have as much uh, to deal with, as much overhead supply, because the in, through the basing problem, not the basing problem, the basing process, you don't have the problem of the overhead supply as bad. And if you do, it's a little bit further back. When a market... does something like what uh, silver did. It's kind of like it came off its lows and then it, it kind of did all this and then now it's turning back up. Well, you've got to deal with some of this trading back here in order to get back to new highs. Whereas if something bottoms out, it just has a little bit more clear air if you go back in time. Okay, you don't have as much overhead supply. So that's another reason why I'm not super duper excited about silver and gold. But the good thing is, if you look at the gold shares on an individual issue basis, I would imagine that we could get some gold shares coming off of more major lows just because companies uh, run into issues and problems and all, and then they finally get their act together and they bottom out at low levels. So we'll probably, gold and silver, the underlying metals, not as excited about, but gold and silver stocks based on the action in the underlying could probably set up soon. Okay. Now let's talk about. Um, good morning, Dave. I barely made it. Well, I barely made it too, Lewis. <laughs> Don't feel lonely. Uh, let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's take a look at some sector action. Um, the P's, as you can see, tried to break out of their base and they came back in. So that scores is a bit of a bummer. But it's not the end of the world, nor can you see it from here. Uh, they're still just, what, how far away from all-time highs? Less than a percent away from all-time highs. So let's err on the side of the longer-term trend. Let's give the market the benefit of the doubt for now. By the way, you might want to write that down. When a market is within and then decide on how many percent you want, 5% maybe, 2%, whatever you want, especially 1% of all-time highs, you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend. Give it the benefit of doubt. Don't try to be a hero. Let the market do what it has to do to possibly shake some people out, like, like it did back here, okay? Earlier this year, it didn't look so hot. I'm sorry, late last year, it's like, well, wait a minute. It looks like we have a pretty serious sell-off here, and that shook some people out. And then now hey, guess what? This breakout failed. So there's probably some people betting on this market to fail for whatever reasons. So there's probably some eager shorts that have already jumped in, piled aboard, piled on, okay? But your life will get a lot easier when you give markets the benefit of the doubt as long as they're hovering around brand new highs or all-time highs, I should say, okay? Now let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ looked a little bit better than the P's. It had this little consolidation in here, broke out, came back, retested its base, and then now it's sort of trying to come out a little bit, okay? And guess what? It's less than a quarter percent away from all-time highs, especially on a closing basis, right? 
what is that? Yeah, oh, okay, a little bit more than a quarter percent. Okay, close enough for government work. So let's give the NASDAQ the benefit of the doubt, too. Now, Russell 2000, eh, a little bit more trickier, but let's make a measurement on that one. Now, Russell's going to be a little bit more volatile than those other indices. So it's within uh, two and a quarter percent. Just had a little loosey moment there. Eh. But Russell 2000, a little bit more sideways than the rest of the indices. Time for it to get moving. I bet Phil would plot a 50-day moving average. So let's just, for S and G's, put a 50-day moving average in this. And I usually don't use the 50 that much, but when the market is beginning to consolidate like this or pulls back, uh, somewhat deeply. I like to see where the 50 is. And look at that. It's just kind of hanging around that 50. And we have a little bit of daylight above the 50. We had daylight above the 50, by the way, from here all the way to here. And another write that down moment is, as a general statement, and you could pick your favorite moving average. I don't care what you use. But as a general statement, if the market has upside daylight and lots of it, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, then you probably want to be long that market. If the market has downside daylight, meaning that the lows are less than the moving average, I'm sorry, the highs are less, less than the moving average, then you probably want to be generally short that market. So right here you can see quite a bit of downside daylight, right here quite a bit of upside daylight, okay? And then right now we don't have any daylight because we're right at the market. Again, daylight means the low, you can see light between the low and the moving average. We clean this chart up and let's just do that one more time. Okay, you can see light, so to speak, if you were shining a flashlight behind the chart, between the lows and the moving average. Okay. Now let's take a look at some of the sector action. What's kind of cool is some new areas are beginning to wake up. And specifically yesterday I noticed health service was banging out new highs. Not doing so great today but kind of beginning to break out a little bit, as you can see. And as you know, markets rarely move in a straight line for us, right? When it's obvious to break it out, what they do, they have a shakeout, okay? Break out, then shake out, and then they take off, okay? A couple areas not doing so hot, like retail, specifically department stores, just look absolutely abysmal in here, as you can see. Pretty serious downtrend there, a little bounce today, but nothing to get too excited about. Transports, pull them back in here below their little prior breakout. Let's not get too excited just yet. Some areas here are, um, are doing okay. Uh, somebody emailed me this morning saying, hey, Dave, I know you don't like the shippers. Well, never say never, okay? I like the shippers now. They're shaping up. The reason, in general, I don't like the shippers is uh, I did some mechanical testing a while back, and it's kind of like back in my commodity days, I discovered that the S&P 500, believe it or not, doesn't trend very well because it's a choppy and noisy market. You're much better off in uh, commodities such as the grains and, and other commodities, metals, et cetera, than the S&P 500. Well, that same sort of reasoning showed me that educational stocks don't tend to trend that well and shipping stocks don't tend to trend that well. But right now, they're doing okay. So it's good to do the research and have it in the back of your mind. But in some cases, you might want to go ahead and take the trade anyway because personalities of stocks and sectors can change over time. I don't know with the reasoning that um, shippers are doing well. Maybe it has something to do with making America great again. I don't know. I'm not going to read too much into it. You know I me, mean? I don't like to confuse the issue with facts too much, at least. Um, a lot of sectors, speaking of uh, building walls and making America great, manufacturing kind of hanging in there, uh, materials and construction kind of hanging in there. Media is actually doing pretty good in spite of uh, not liking the media. By the way, um, not me not liking the media, present the current administration. By the way, I got an email from someone who doesn't like the current administration and they're going to back off from trading, and, and um, they had other reasons too, but you can't let what's happening in the world, in the government, or in other governments, you can't let that influence your trading. You have to be a purist, and as I said a few weeks back, you would think that gun stocks wouldn't have done so well 
with an anti-gun president, but they went up eight and nine hundred percent. Depends on which ones you're looking at, but they had a tremendous run. I have a friend who is really into guns, and he said Obama is the best thing that's ever happened to guns. Okay, so sometimes it could be a little counter intuitive when it comes to all these things so you got to be careful not to get too concerned i've actually gotten heated debates with people because i'm not passionate enough about politics and and i try to explain to them that i can't let it influence me because that has nothing to do with with trading okay it's the perception not the reality. You might want to write that down. So as a general statement, most sectors looking pretty good. And anything technology related or most anything technology related looking okay. You can see hardware up near new highs. Software has pulled back a little bit. And if you're going to have hardware, you're going to need software for your hardware, right? But today it's having a pretty good day, trying to rally out of a pullback. So we could see some setups there. Take a look at the semis right off of these multi-year highs. In fact, right now, bam. Highest level since 2000, okay? So that's 16-year highs, okay? Why not just hit a longer time frame like weekly to see a trend? Well, sometimes I do that, but here's where you have to be careful. By the time a trend emerges on a weekly chart, the trend might be over with, okay? And let's say you're just watching a, a weekly index, okay, at it might begin to roll over, then it might begin to implode when a weekly chart is just going to look like a pullback, but you have a bona fide rollover in place, okay? And you don't, no matter what, you have to honor your stops on individual issues. So, yeah, look at the weekly charts. Yes, look at longer-term charts to gain perspective, but realize that, let's say, a weekly TKO on a stock or an index or a commodity, a Forex or a cornflakes, whatever, you know, a weekly TKO, which you could say is bullish, could actually be a daily bow tie or some sort of other pattern, okay? And here's where I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. When you're trading emerging trends, I was doing a webinar yesterday talking about emerging trends. When you're trading emerging trends, you are a bit of a pioneer because you are still fighting that longer-term trend to some extent, okay? So, yeah, you have to look at everything. But as a general statement, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use weekly charts in and of themselves, okay? Bob says, Momo. <laughs> you like Momo? Oh, Momo, a stock? Okay, we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, we'll get the stocks just one second. Beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, that's Phil. Guess where the Russell's hanging out? Yeah, it's, it's, it's mixing... Um, it, it's hanging around the 50-day moving average. Do not mix politics with trading and only divides people? Yeah, you know, anything you factor into trading that has nothing to do with price can really fudge up your trading. Okay, you might want to write that down, too. Okay, uh, I think I've kind of made the point. For the most part, most sectors look pretty good. A couple of other ones I just want to touch upon real quick. Um, energies are a bit of a bummer because they're breaking down a little bit below their base. But as I often say, sometimes you get a little break below a base and then it takes off to space. Just a little fake out move. So let's not get too excited about the energies. Uh, let's kind of use that not too far from their old time, not all time highs, but multi year highs in this case. Let's use that line of reasoning. Also, let's take a look at a weekly like um, who pointed out a minute ago. Howard, I think you pointed that out. On a weekly basis, you can see it just kind of made, it looks like it's just trying to make a little bit of a knockout move, okay? So let's err on the side of a longer-term trend, but let's be cognizant of the fact that they could be rolling over and losing a little steam because they haven't gone anywhere in what? Quite a while, since uh, since December, mid-December. So let's just, let's just sit tight here a little bit, make sure we really like some individual stocks before going after them, and honor our stops if we're really long, okay? Metals and mining, not doing too bad, just off of these multi-year highs, so so far so good there. And again, most sectors look pretty good with a few notable exceptions. Today's tomorrow, do you worry about yesterday? <laughs> well, you know, you got to be careful, too, when you're dealing with economists, because an economist will tell you tomorrow, while Woody predicted yesterday didn't, why Woody predicted yesterday didn't come true today. 
I think I got that right. <laughs> Wrap your head around that, right? <laughs> An economist will tell you tomorrow why what he predicted yesterday didn't come true today. I think I said that correctly. So you got to be really careful if you factor in any sort of extraneous information into your trade. All right, let's go ahead and uh, open up for individual stocks. Bob wants to know about Momo. Is that a stock? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Internet, Momo Internet. Um, first thing kind of jumps out at me is it, it has gone a little sideways in here as of late, okay? Next thing I see is it's got a lot of overhead supply to deal with, okay? So we backed the chart way out. I think I would pass because it's a little bit of electrocardiogram. It had a good run back here, but it does tend to bounce around quite a bit, and it's not really set up. And you could argue that, well, it's just kind of a pullback in here, and it's like, okay, well, that's fine, but it's getting ready to push into this overhead supply. And it's also a mid-level setup. So I'd be more excited if it was coming off of like major lows like this or if it was up in clear air. Like it looked pretty good back here. Okay. And by clear air, I'll show you what I mean. Let me just zoom in a little bit. If I can get there. Oh, it's kind of a newer stock. It's going to be hard to get there. Let's see. So back here, it looked a little bit better. You could see it had clear air, had nothing above it, and it also had a little bit of acceleration higher. So this looked pretty darn good. Now, it really didn't pan out, okay? Maybe a little bit. Maybe you could have been lucky enough to, to get partial profits up here somewhere. They get stopped on a remainder. Kind of like that Novin trade, better than the Pocono is what I say. One day at a time, ignore the forecast. Yeah, you know, as I often say, you can only look so far out when it comes to markets, and that's why I'm so picky. And a lot of times you think I'm like Mike, and I hate everything when you ask about all these stocks, and that's because you can only look so far out, and everything has to sort of align. I need ideally trend, and ideally, uh, even more ideally, I should say, an accelerating trend. I want persistency in that trend. Ideally, I like to see wide range bars in the direction of the trend. And then an orderly sort of pullback or a TKO type of move. It's like, I need all these things to sort of come together. And even when you do have the ideal setup, I mean, sometimes it's like, I'll see a setup and I just know I'm going to make money on it. My clients are like, why don't you tell us? It's like, well, because sometimes I'm wrong too. Nobody knows for sure what's going to happen. But if you have all these things lining up, you know there's a pretty good chance that you are going to get a swing trade profit out of it, okay? There's still some uncertainty. That's why you have to use a stop. But you know that there's a pretty good chance if you look for all these things I talk about, uh, everything that I talked about in the 14 hours when I spent 14 hours doing a course just on stock selection, okay, picking stocks, stock picking. When you look for all those things, and by the way, watch the, the introductory uh, part of that. Watch the first hour. You can do that for free. And a lot of these things I talk about in here, such as overhead supply, persistency, uh, ability for a stock to trade cleanly. A lot of that's covered in that first half, uh, hour and a half, or hour, whatever it is. So check that out. But yes, you can only predict so far, but you can follow forever, is what I like to preach. Uh, Jeff, I like that stock, but it's in my lander list for today. Uh, it is a shipping stock, and I like it. So um, I'll give you a, a, a thumbs up on that one. But unfortunately, out of uh, bring it up next week, and we'll talk about it. Money for 700 feet of wall was approved in 06 by Senators Biden, Clinton, and Obama, among others. Obama got Canada to pay for border. Huh. Bridge, 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 Detroit, Windsor in 2015. Well, yeah, you know, you're confusing the issue with facts. Um, you're welcome, Bob. Uh, you're confusing the issue with facts, and obviously... There are two sides, and if one person on one side says something, then, of course, it's, it's wrong. I mean, you know, look at, look at what they did with, to Melania. I mean, uh, Michelle Obama gives a speech, and she's applauded, and then Melania gives the same exact speech, that everybody had a big deal, made a big deal about that, you know? So it shows you it's just two sides, right? Actually, that was at the press meeting. <laughs> Still that. Back to stocks. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. CRNT for Gary, CRNT. Um, 
Well, uh, it would actually have to make new highs and then pull back again, okay? So right now you can see it's kind of sideways in here, and you can enlarge this range a little bit. But yeah, it would have to break out to new highs and then pull back again for me to get interested. If you're long, stay long. John, uh, we can't talk about that one. Uh, boy, you guys are all over it. That's great. That's a good stock. Yeah. Uh, we can't well, – email me privately and I can discuss that with you. I can't talk about that. Uh, stocks that are on my Landry list I, I don't talk about during the show, okay? Get under delayed service and you'll see them in about a week. <laughs> okay? All right, any more stocks? You guys are quiet today. Vail? Oh, here we go. Not enough acceleration. Yeah, Vail could be uh, – Vail's okay. Uh, I'd like a little bit more pullback. This was the one that uh, I was talking about earlier. We were long this one. It just kind of skirted right along that stop, and then it took off again. Um, I think it just needs a tiny bit more pullback. You don't want too much. You don't want to pull all the way back to this prior little breakout, but a little bit more pullback would kind of be nice on that one. kind of like to see that happen, okay? Uh, but, no, the acceler you said uh, Giants is not enough acceleration. No, it's plenty of acceleration. You can see that it's sort of uh, accelerated higher in more recent times. Okay, and if you're connecting these lows, I suppose it's not going to be perfect, but you can see if you said, okay, this stock worked its way higher, it did accelerate higher. Uh, just for Phil's sake, let's just see where that, that test was. I know he likes that 50. Oh, look at that. There's Phil. That's a Phil trade right there. <laughs> Phil likes that 50-day moving average. Look at that. That's pretty cool. I have to admit, it is kind of cool, Phil. And, you know, here's a good example of daylight, okay? Daylight, uh, one day of no daylight, and then daylight, okay? Great concept. Phil says, I held Vail and now up 30% plus. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I was torn between covering Veil and not covering Veil this week because I didn't want to throw salt in the wounds of, of the clients who followed the system exactly and got out of the stop. But I weigh that against if I could teach you how to squeeze more profits out of a trade, then I would be negligent in not doing that as the educator part of me. As you know, so I, I just feel feel like I have to do this, knowing that, unfortunately, some people won't be happy about this. But next time, when the situation comes along, they will be. PTLA, I thought you were saying I was a pain in the ass. PTLA for Angelo. Uh, it's a little too wide and loose. you got a big wide range down bar here. you got a big wide range up bar here. What I would do with this one is, let's just see... If it could break out to new highs and start getting its act together, I mean, obviously you'll have a little resistance to deal with along the way, but let's wait for it to set up. So if it can keep breaking out to new highs, maybe. But I think there are better stocks out there at this particular point in time. HIIQ for Jim. HIIQ. And let's do that. Uh, super duper 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 thin. Well, it's got okay vibe. I'm just thin today, huh? I guess it's okay. Um, I hear you. It's not bad. But it does have a little sideways action in here, okay? So it's lost a little steam. It's not bad. Uh, I guess if you looked it from here to here, it, it's okay. Um, I, would, I would look through the sector and see what else you can find now that health services have improved, okay? But it's certainly not bad, but I think you can do better. OCLR, OCLUR. Now, keep in mind, by the way, that uh, I'm not seeing a whole lot of setups either. Like somebody a while back said, you never like anything that I pick. Well, back then, there really wasn't a whole lot. Do you have another symbol for me? OCLUR. I have to because I don't know. I know only know stocks by their symbols usually, and I don't have. So let me just delete that one. John, John, are you are you on my service? <laughs> John picked a, John picked another one that's on the that's actually a setup for today, so we can't talk about that one either. Did not manage to understand if, according to you, Vale is uptrend is still ongoing. Yeah, uh, Robert, uh, the up absolutely the uptrend of Vale is still there. 
In fact, it's actually begun to accelerate a little bit in here, okay? So, but the only thing I would like to see is just a tiny bit more pullback. I'd like to see a dip below 10 before treating it as a new position, okay? Hopefully that answers that question. Bracket a pullback? Maybe. Let's take a look at that. Um, actually, you know, I bend the rules. I, with this one, I think I bend the rules a little bit. And I would treat it, the, the rules for the IPO pattern, for those of you who had the course, the buy at B pattern, the rules for that is um, that it has to be below $20 a share. But since the market's doing so great lately, I've been bending that rule a little bit. And then low 20s, I'm still uh, looking for uh, breakout things, breakout characteristics. I, I'd prefer to see a little bit more range in it. But I think that instead of waiting for a pullback, I think that you could play more of a breakout type of pattern here, okay? So, John, I would look for that possibly on a breakout. That's definitely on my, uh, on my list. Okay. Uh, Marv, it turns out, well, it's hard for me to get excited about something like Marriott. I mean, look at the HV. It's 14, okay? So the HV is a little low on this, and it's also... Uh, quite sideways in here. It hasn't made any forward progress since on a net net basis since when? Since uh, December. So we've got two months of completely sideways action. Um, I bet if we throw a bow tie in here, well, not too bad. But you can see the bow ties have flattened out. Kind of has a double top look to it. I mean, if anything, I'm more inclined to short something that's um, a more efficient, lower volatility stock than I am to buy it. So if anything, I'd keep my eye out on this one as a possible short, okay? Uh, Dino, I like that one, but it's on my list for today. So good eye on that one. So we can't talk about it. Um, it was kind of choppy back here. This one's pretty thin though. It might be too thin. Uh, this all this, let's see if we get rid of this choppy action and see what it's doing now. No, I can't make it do that. Uh, what if we, is there a way to, isn't there a way to not fill the bars, not fill all the bars? I don't know how to do it on the fly. I have to show spread. Oh, here we go. Spread. There we go. That's what I want to do. Let's do that. And then let's see if we can, um, you know, this trading back here is kind of all over the place, but from here to here, it looks okay. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback. I know sometimes with IPOs, you have to be willing to uh, to take like a flag pattern. So I'm going to say okay. It's not the best looking setup in the world, but if you just look at it from here to here, it looks kind of interesting, but super duper duper thin. So be super careful with that, okay? All right, Angelo, take care, man. AVHI for Mr. Jeff. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, what I like about it is I'd like to see a few more days in the breakout if I was looking for perfection, but it looks pretty good. Uh, first, first pullback after a base breakout is a great pattern. The only problem that's kind of jumping out at me is it's really thin, okay? So I would say no because it's thin, but if we're speaking in hypotheticals, which I guess all this is because it's for education purposes anyway, I would say, yeah, that's a really good looking, uh, good looking setup. First pullback after base breakout. You can put a stop down here in the base or even below the base if you could stomach it, uh, if you're triggered and it really shouldn't drop back into that base. So that's a good looking setup with the caveat that it's too thin. Add to TGB, I'm more pullback. TGB, I am long, as we discussed a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, could be another little swing trade in here. Uh, it was a nice little trade back here, and then the, if it pulls back a little bit deeper, absolutely. Okay, and I'm I'm trying to see it antiseptically and not because I'm already long, but yeah. Jim wants to know about Jag. Jaguar. For men who like to get, oh, never mind. Anyway, what was that uh, show where they had the um, truth in advertising? They hired a bunch of uh, insane people to do the advertising. Jaguar. For men who like to get from beautiful women, they hardly know. Um, I would put this on my watch list, okay? One, two, three, four, five. It, it, we cannot set up until tomorrow. 
because what's the rules with IPOs? They have to trade for five days. Okay, that's my rule at least. So yeah, put that on the watch list. Absolutely. You have a Jag? Phil, what do you have? They're beautiful cards. Just don't know about the <laughs> buy one for parts. I've often toyed with the idea of getting an XJS and throwing a Chevy 350 in it. 2000 XJR. Oh, cool. Uh, just so it'd be reliable. That's a lot of money. You still got a car that's a, a bastardization and no, nobody will want it. Maybe I'll wait for somebody to do one and get it from them. Let them take the hit on it. Yeah, CNX looks good. Needs more of a pullback, though. We talked about this one last week. So if it pulls back, let's say, to 13 and a half or so, that'd be a pretty good-looking uh, trade. Very. Ford owned it for a while. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, there's people that debate on whether Ford did them good or not, but uh, I don't know. CENX. Yeah, we just did that one. Uh, IFCHR. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Uh, we talked about this one a while back being a, um, a breakout pattern in the IPO. Just get a DeLorean. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, right here. So, yeah, this one actually either either a knockout type of move, and that would be a double top knockout, or I like to see it make new highs and pull back. But either way, put it on your watch list. Used to have the best dealer service in, in HTE history. They gave it a lot of practice. <laughs> Jaguar or the DeLorean? Wasn't DeLorean underpowered? Yeah, maybe a little bit more pullback. This is another new issue. Um, oh, wait a minute. That's not a new issue. Yeah, maybe a little bit more pullback. My only problem, I think I said this last week, I don't like the fact that most of the trend is pretty much just one bar up. I think you could probably find something else out there. I mean, it looks okay. You're not, you could find something certainly worse, okay? If that makes any sense. Form bought more recently, longer term, it looks interesting. Form. Uh, well, I don't see why you were buying that, but, uh, you know, it's kind of wide and loose, but it's kind of getting its act together in here. Maybe on follow through, uh, if it can follow through to the upside, it is a little persistent lately, but yeah, I would avoid that. I mean, if you're long as you are, stay long. Don't let me mess up your trade. Try your stop. <laughs> so Jag dealer service is the best uh, for Jags. All right, that's good to know. They've always been great looking cars. I, I have to say, my wife was looking at my shirt. She goes, she goes, you showed her the other day. You looking at Jaguars? I'm like, yeah, they just look good. I like them. <laughs> uh, this is this needs a little bit of momentum, okay? Because. Let's measure this. You can see it's only going up about 4%, and this is a fairly volatile uh, semiconductor type of stock, so that's really not that much. So it would actually have to break out decisively and then pull back, okay? Gelled for a watch list, J-E-L-D, J-E-L-D. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's uh, cement, materials of construction. Maybe they're going to uh, some cement for the wall, right? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, wait for follow through and then maybe a pullback. Yeah, S and D, uh, we're long S and D in the service. Um, but yeah, it looks okay. It's on my land list for today. And the reason I could talk about it is because we're already long. Uh, yeah, I think it looks good. Uh, nice. It's still an IPO. Now keep in mind with IPOs, I do, I am a little bit more lenient with the patterns. Okay. Um, there's a little bit more excitement with IPOs. So, yeah, it's so far nice thrust higher, just kind of pulling back. Yeah, absolutely. Put your best clients in it. HBM. Uh, well, it didn't really break out too far past its prior highs in here. It looks okay. Uh, ideally, I would have preferred if it had broke out a little bit further past these prior highs in here and then pull back. Okay, but, yeah, put it on your watch list. Why not? Kara, 
Is there a stock name Lot? Nope. It'd be fun to say Kiara and Lot. Uh, yeah, it looks okay. Nice uh, accelerated breakout uh, on a pullback. It needs to pull back a little bit, but obviously not all the way back to where it broke out from. Absolutely. Biotechnology. Let's take a look at the uh, sub-industry. And you can see biotechnology is, is kind of choppy and sideways. Now, earlier I said that technology was doing pretty good. Not all technology, okay? Um, you can see biotech just kind of mostly sideways and choppy for a long, long time, kind of all over the place. It doesn't mean that I won't buy a biotech stock. We just talked about Novin. We were long Novin, right? Uh, it was an IPO and a biotech, but we liked it, okay? So if you see a setup and you really like it, then go for it. But ideally, you want as many pieces uh, or as many pieces of the puzzle to, to fit. So ideally, you want the market headed higher. Well, check for the most part, market's headed higher, especially NASDAQ, right? Um, you want the sector headed higher, not so much with biotech, okay? Hank says, IP, welcome, Hank. Uh, this, is this your first time, Hank? Glad to have you. Uh, IPGP, IPGP. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of all over the place, kind of electrocardiogram. Now, I hear you. It's breaking out. Uh, but so far, it's really just one big bar in this breakout. But it's okay. You know, maybe on a pullback. Um, let's talk about it next week, and we'll see where it is. But it definitely needs a little bit of pullback, okay? F-O-R-M bought recently. Yeah, we talked about that one. And uh, welcome to the show, Hank. INSW. I see a lot of... Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. Um, these are recorded, so I'm not going to talk about stocks we've already talked about. And it'll be on YouTube in a little while. Give me a few hours at least. Yeah, we talked about that one. That one looks good, Jeff. Absolutely. NGL. Um... This one's okay. Uh, let's see. It's got okay volume. Um, is this fairly new? It's okay. It needs a little bit more of a knockout move. Um, it's okay. It's it's not really jumping out at me. But, yeah, maybe a little bit of knockout move would be okay. But for some reason, it's not really jumping out at me. I-M-O-S. Uh, no, this is just too sideways. So, um you know, let's let let this thing get above sixteen fifty, and then let's talk again. And if you're if you're trading the IPO breakout pattern based on one of the rules, would actually have to close above eighteen. Okay, so uh, get back with me when it does that, and it might be worthwhile. Mac, you have a knack for that stock? Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks good. Uh, this is one that was in the Landry list back here, I believe. Uh, on a little bit more pullback, it's quite volatile, so just be careful. Uh, HV 123, but it's it's had one heck of a run and looks pretty darn good. So yeah, I think you could certainly do a lot worse than that. That looks good. Imos, Imos. Yeah, we talked about that one. Sorry about that. CVGW, CVGW. Uh, as a short, no, I don't see it. I'm not getting it. Um, no, it's too much of an electrocardiogram. Um, I, I'd almost, I know, I don't know if it's the same Craig that was looking at the uh, AMD. We've got a couple of Craigs in here. Uh, on the short side, I just prefer something a little cleaner like this. See, I just made this gradual rollover, and then obviously it did materialize, but fortunately it didn't, in, it didn't form an entry. Uh, something that trades a little bit more cleanly, okay, as opposed to something that looks a little bit more like an electrocardiogram, okay. All right, Sam wants to know about Cirrus. Um, well, the problem with it now is that you've got this big gap, okay? Now, if you're familiar with reversal, my pattern of reversal gap strategy, it does have a little potential support in here. But if this stock breaks below this range and then pulls back a little bit, kind of like looks like this a little bit, okay? If I, I don't know if that will let me do it. Let's see. No, I can't. Uh, let me draw this a little further over. So if it breaks down below the range and pulls back a little bit, then, yeah, that would be a pretty good short. And the reason being that you would have all this overhead supply, meaning that anybody who bought in this range would be looking to get out at break even. 
In other words, supply or look to sell a stock if it rolls back up. So yeah, if you drop below the range, it could be a short. SYMC. But I'm not a huge fan of going out and shorting a whole lot just yet. Yeah, this one looks okay. Uh, who's this? Uh, uh, Arsene? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, it's kind of a double top knockout. I'd almost like to see a little bit more knockout, but it did break out below above this uh, range. I, I think that looks pretty good. Again, looking for perfection, maybe if it was a little bit closer to 26, but it certainly does look interesting. ASIX, almost at high five, not quite. Haven't given out any high fives today. Yeah, I've been watching this one on a pullback, absolutely. A little more pullback. XIV, it's going to be one of those VIX things, uh, not a fan. Um is this one that, that always goes up or has to go up because of the way they, they have to rebalance a lot of these things and they usually go up. But keep in mind, they can change the rules on you at any given time with these VIX things. I don't want to get into them because I'll get into a lot of trouble. You'll see how little I actually know about them. But I know in general, you want to avoid these VIX ETN things uh, unless you truly understand them. They're like a derivative of a derivative of a derivative, okay? So be careful with that kind of stuff. TGS, did we talk about that one? Um, on follow-through and possibly a pullback, it's a little bit on the thin side, but it's okay. It's not too bad. Um, but more follow-through and a pullback, absolutely. VSM. Uh, no, let's see. I don't know why it had all these big wide range bars. I let that break out the new highs and then look to play pullback. Jeff, good eye. That's on the Landry list. Uh, can't talk about it, but uh, good eye. High five. <laughs> How's that? First high five of the day. INFO. Uh, all right, James had to leave. Well, we covered that, James. Um, yeah, this looks okay. Uh, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit on the low HV side, and it's kind of choppy and wide and loose. But I hear you. It's broken out, and I think I'd pass. It's just this is something about it with the way it's just kind of. I don't like the way it generally trades. Okay, and, and if anything, the HV is a little too low. VIX can be very good if you understand them, because no one understands them. Yeah, VIX things can be good. Yeah, and that's the problem. And and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I'm friends with Larry McMillan, and he's given some big VIX speeches at the American Association of Professional Technical Analyst meetings. And I'm always uh, fascinated by them because, I mean, he really knows what he's doing. And so if you really know what you're doing, it's fine. But he's even pointed out uh, over a couple of beers that sometimes, even on CNBC, they'll have guests on there that are totally wrong in what they're saying about those instruments. And these are people who are a lot smarter than me when it comes to these options and derivatives. And if, if they can't, if they don't fully understand it, then I know that it, it's probably not a good idea for me to go out and do a lot of these things uh, or trade these things. So, yeah, you have to really understand what you're dealing with, and it, it's complex, okay? Uh, Larry, Larry, Larry manages money, too, so Larry actually uses them in his fund, I believe. Larry understands them. Fund managers do not, and therein lies the opportunity. Yeah, that's what the fund managers screw up uh, a lot of times with these VIX things, thinking they're getting a hedge, and they're not because of the decay in the futures. And again, I want to show you how little I know, but it's a lot more complex than you think. Okay, you lose a small fortune if you don't know what you're doing, and I have in VIX products. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, stay away from those things. I, I would, unless you really, really know what you're doing. And, and and again, as I just said, if some people who who should know better are, are, are as Larry pointed out, uh, or saying the wrong things, then then uh, you know, just just run. Don't walk away from them. And keep in mind, too, that you can't use trend following and, and those type of things because you're you're actually dealing with uh, decay and volatility. And, boy, that's where it gets really complex really fast, okay? And if you try to put logic to them, that doesn't work either sometimes. Uh, no, this is kind of uh, – this does not jump out at me for some reason. It's just kind of wide and loose. I think you could probably find something cleaner in the semiconductors. I mean, here's the deal. If you take a look at the, let's take a look at the overall sector. 
you know, if the overall sector looks something like this, and then in more recent times, a lot more cleaner, it's accelerating higher. I mean, it's not a perfect chart. You know, it's going to be a little bit more efficient and not be as clean as some individual issues. But for the most part, it's worked its way higher. It's accelerating higher. I'd much rather find something that looks a little bit more like the sector than something that looks kind of like that, just kind of uh, longer term. So I was on my screen on. Yes, it is. Uh, sometimes what happens is, let's see, unless it went away. Yeah, screen's on. Um, maybe uh, sometimes a squirrel will get his nuts caught in the wire somewhere between. Uh, he'll be moving his nuts and get them caught in the wire somewhere between me and you. So that happens. But it's it's being recorded. And recordings are usually pretty efficient. Okay. Uh, PME for Donald. PME. Uh, yeah, we talked about that one, I do believe. Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. Uh, EMES as a substitution. EMES. Yeah, it's beginning to break out. Uh, it needs to pull back. The problem is if it begins to pull back, then it's going to be back into this little breakout. And it's a little wide and loose. Um, it looks okay. I have it in momentum, my momentum list. Easy for me to say. Phil says, I trade them all the time, but I understand them. I love it when people trade them technically or buy them as hedges. As neither of those things make sense, your warning your novices is correct. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole problem. And I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but they were talking about something. Uh, and I don't know. And, again, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but the point was that somebody was on TV talking about using them as a hedge, and, and it just wouldn't work in, in the way they were saying. And, and, and it's a complex thing. Uh, I'm not a big fan of derivatives. I'm not a huge fan of options. It's just too many moving parts, and you really got to know what you're doing um, to do those type of things. I just much prefer, I think it's easier and better just to follow the trend and trade trends like we do. Uh, yeah, we talked about that one, didn't we? Yeah, okay. No, Kara doesn't have too much of a pullback, I don't think. AOI. AOI. Um, well, one problem I have is you have this massive day higher here, and that's pretty much your entire trend, okay? Ideally, I like to see trends develop over time, and notice that it took off, and then it just kind of uh, lost some steam in here, so uh, I would I would pass on that one. AA? AA. Oops. AA. Yeah, I've been watching this one. Um, Alcoa. I don't know why it's a new issue again. I thought Alcoa has been around forever. Uh, it needs a little bit deeper pullback, though. I, at this particular point in time, it had to break out the new highs and then pull back. Yeah, didn't we cover that one? We keep bringing up Kara. Uh, several of you keep asking. Didn't we talk about that one? Yeah, on a pullback, sure. But it needs to pull back. NGL. Yeah, we talked about that one. Uh, on... No, it's too sideways. I mean, it's a semiconductor, and it's mostly sideways for, what, three months? And then what's going on with the semis? Let's take a look at the subsector in this particular case, just for s and Subsector looks pretty good, looks a lot better. Overall, semis look really good. So if, if the subsector looks like that, try to find something that looks like that. GS is a pullback or rollover. GS, uh, I think it's beginning of a rollover, Okay. So let's uh, just eyeballing it. You can see it kind of made a top here, kind of like a little bit of a cup and handle here. So let's throw the moving averages in. When in doubt, throw a moving average in. You can see that we are beginning to cross over. So, yeah, that's that's a, I would call that at this point in time a rollover. And then remember earlier we were talking about overhead supply. So what do we have happening now? Anybody who bought this stock in this range could be looking to get out of break even if the stock begins to rally. So, yeah, that could be a possible short. Not a big fan of shorting in this environment, but uh, I would much prefer shorting something like GS than some sort of wild and crazy uh, biotech stock or something like that where you could really get hurt badly. SQNS. Not just can't get hurt in other things. Now, uh, I think we talked about this. We're kind of wide and loose and just all over the place. I, maybe once it made new highs, if it traded cle cleanly, but too many ifs in that statement. And then also uh, kind of thin. Did we talk about semantic? I think we did, didn't we? Yeah, we talked about that. 
We did. Okay. Let's just clean this up. PCRX. Yeah, this is um, this is kind of bottoming out in here. I mean, it does have a little resistance along the way, but I hear you, uh, Phil. And it's a little wide and loose too, though. Uh, let's check the bow ties. Pretty serious bow tie going on. Uh, very clean, boy. I tell you, if you, if you uh, took the chart out, it would look pretty good, huh? Let's do that for S and G's. Take the chart out. What does he mean? Let's see if we did that. See, you can see the. That's kind of a fun thing I used to do early in my career is take the chart out and just kind of look at the moving averages and say, hey, would you be long or short this stock? Well, you'd be long because you got a bow tie here. But when you put the chart back in, um, it's a little wide and loose. I hear you, man. It looks like it's bottomed out. It's okay. Not perfect, but okay. Certainly okay. T Doc. We got time for just a couple of more. You guys want to get them in real quick. My problem here is that it it kind of broke out and then it kind of pulled back to where it broke out from. And then it's also kind of wide and loose. So I would let it follow through. Expo never bought. E X F O. Yeah, it looks good. Uh on a pullback though, it's gonna to have to pull back, right? Uh what does the methodology require? Pull back. It's very thin now, and then it's kind of wide and loose longer term, but it's gotten its act together in more recent times. Maybe on a pullback. Yeah, or uh, Arsene, we talked about that one. Uh, Kara on more of a pullback, absolutely. Okay, AKAO for Jim. No, this is one we talked about last week. It's just the, the, the main breakout was it went from what? We'll cut percentage-wise. What kind of move is that? Let's see. Measure from here to there and one or two bars it went up 159 percent no I would I'd leave that one alone it's too crazy Robert says Facebook is not something I follow but quarter results came out just yesterday great yesterday night so I decided to scalp today it broke its high not sure I managed to see a long term on this though well okay you gotta have a plan and it's kinda like uh, I don't know if I'm hearing you correctly. Or are you thinking about sticking with it longer term or you got to scalp? I mean, if you scalp off earnings and that's what you do, then that's what you should do, okay? But it's not it's not what I do, okay? I have a very simple longer term, short to intermediate term, I should say, trend following methodology. I'm not trying to go in for a scalp. Um, but if your plan is to go in for a scalp and then take some partial profits and keep a piece, then that's what you do. Just be careful, though, because if you're just getting a scalp off of things, you might not be making enough money to withstand holding for longer term. Okay? Now, keep in mind that you might be thinking, but Dave, aren't you, like, going in for a scalp? No, it's not a scalp. I'm going in for a swing trade which is over several days to several weeks looking for a decent gain, and then I'm going to trail a stop in attempts to catch capturing a longer-term trend. And with any methodology, you have to control losses while still allowing for unlimited gains. And that's a tough thing to do. That's a, that's a kind of a walking in the fine line. And I've spent years working on that, and, and the only way I could do that or figure out how to do that is to take the swing trade and then trail that stop longer term like we did in the CNX, okay? Oh, okay, Robert said I'm asking for long term, okay? Uh, well, Facebook's kind of all over the place. Um, it's a very efficient stock. It's a very thick stock, okay? By efficient, it tends to chop around. Uh, yeah, you could argue that it's trended longer term. I hear you. Um, volume is tremendous on this thing, and HV is fairly low. So for me to get excited about it, which I probably won't, it would have to break out to new highs, okay? And it it is a little wide and loose, as you can see. And it looks like it's jerk. Looks like it's a earnings, earnings, uh, earnings. Uh, you know, it looks like it just gets jerked around by earnings every three months. So I think I would pass on that one. I mean, if it followed through and got clean, then possible it might be worthwhile. But Facebook uh, is making a lot of you know. Wow, well, I was going to fuse the issue with facts, but Facebook is the place to advertise now. HGV. Um, 
kind of hard to get excited about Hilton, okay? Uh, it's only gone up like four points. Uh, this thing would have to show me a lot more follow-through and then a pullback. It's an I, you know, what's the story, fad of glory when it comes to IPOs? Hilton, eh, I don't know. I'd like to see a lot more follow-through and then maybe a pullback. Facebook, not my favorite for your same reasons either. Okay. All right. Uh, any more? We've got time for just a couple more, one or two more, and then we'll wrap it up. Almost to the end of Yeah, we. this is on the watch list. We talked about this one earlier, uh, Donald. It should be on your watch list. Well, look, uh, looks like we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming, uh, attending, I should say, today. I appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule to be here. I'm obviously humbled by your presence. Uh, good uh, participation today. Uh, both in number and in uh, in quality, and good stock picks too. By the way, you guys are getting better and better. Uh, looks like I might be able to retire soon uh, from this show. Uh, everyone have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, and hopefully, I'll see all of you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.